call is sounded and women fall in for service in their country's cause. Khaki uniform replaces the peacetime diversity of fashion, for in the auxiliary territorial service, women undergo military training and undertake tasks which will relieve men for fighting. This is the object of women's enrollment in the services to enable more men to be spared for the sterner duties of war. The British Navy too has its Women's Royal Naval Service and the Women's Auxiliary Air Force in their sky blue uniforms march behind a band of their own. Then there are women who actually pilot airplanes in wartime. They fly new machines from factory to aerodrome, surely one of the most adventurous jobs which has so far fallen to the fair sex. But the duties performed for the competent services of the Crown are only the beginning of women's contribution in this war. Think of the demands of civil defence, for ambulance driving, which apart from running repairs involves a study of map reading as well as the ability to drive clad in heavy anti-gas clothing. The organisation of air raid precautions calls for women wardens. Women are enrolled in the Auxiliary Fire Service. And thousands are in the picturesque land army. On them the country will rely for a large part of the increased acreage which must be put under the plough. The skill of these experienced hands will provide the homegrown food that the necessities of war dictate. Munitions. How can one start to describe the 101 industrial jobs performed by women? Dangerous jobs in many cases. Their part in aircraft manufacture was witnessed by the king on his tour of the West Country. Indeed, there can be few industries nowadays in which women have no share, while in wartime every industry becomes national in its importance as trade, commerce and finance are seen as vital factors in the struggle. To these paid labours, we must add the contribution which is purely voluntary and introduce women's voluntary services. Chairman of the organisation is Lady Reddy. To this group and to a devoted band of organisers up and down the country goes the credit for a stupendous feat, that of assembling women's voluntary work throughout the kingdom in one concerted drive. For example, the provision of hospital supplies. Here in a famous house, formerly the scene of many a ball or magnificent reception, society women sew and pack, forsaking fashion for white overalls. A modern machine, wielded by expert hand, cuts out 60 garments at a time. Or again at the Royal Hospital Chelsea, the wife of the governor runs a working party with an old pensioner to fetch and carry for the industrious helpers who are arranged in the hall which Charles II built. Country houses have been turned to similar use. White overall and headdress presenting the distinction of uniform while obliterating all other distinctions. But it's also in the smaller homes of the East End of London and the poorer districts of the big provincial cities that the great bulk of comforts for the troops and supplies for the hospitals are being patiently turned out. And don't let's forget the youngsters too. Cheery young folk, happily knitting, not knowing much of what it's all about, except that their fathers, brothers and uncles have gone away somewhere to fight someone called Hitler. <music> Nursing. From village first aid through all its most expert phases, women's unstinted succor is voluntarily given. Here an alarm has sounded. A village hall is rapidly fitted up as a first aid post, and within seven minutes, the locally trained volunteers are ready to attend to casualties. On the seacoast, it sometimes happens that a neutral victim of Nazi warfare is wrecked. First aid is at hand for survivors as they land from lifeboats. First aid and the comfort of warm coverings and hot drinks. Such are the local services organised up and down the country on a national basis. So that the necessary proficiency may be obtained, first aid classes are held continually in every small community. The WVS also recruits for the Civil Nursing Reserve. This young lady is going to be a nursing auxiliary. She attends lectures. She learns to make beds with professional skill and to apply splints and bandages. With fellow students, she enters the hospital. 
She learns to wash a patient in bed. At last her great day comes, an operation. While our young nursing auxiliary cannot actually assist, she prepares and sterilizes instruments. In time of war, the great service of nursing is recognized as second only to that of the fighting forces. The work of healing is carried on in surroundings old and new. Nurses stand by on river steamers, ready to rush the injured out of bombarded cities. Trains, too, are converted into hospital wards. And a new need has been created by this war for hospitals deep in the heart of Britain, safe from air raids. Country mansions such as this have been taken over and staffed with experienced nurses who stand prepared for the dreaded casualties of aerial bombardment. Biggest feat so far of women's voluntary work, the evacuation. That stupendous undertaking of those grave September days being now an accomplished fact, we find children sampling the adventure of life in new homes which the hospitality of country people has provided for them. Some are entertained in big palatial houses with old family servants as well as great ladies to play with them, to read them stories and attend to the babies. Some are received in more humble but intimate homes where their host may be an ex-soldier or for that matter an ex-sailor of the last war. There are other aspects of evacuation. Winter is more rigorous in the country and we all know what kind of a winter 1939 to 1940 was. For the issue of warmer clothes, supply depots are set up in every district. At the same time, they see to it that each child has a gas mask. The small illnesses of childhood are taken care of by sick bays, often just empty houses converted by the local WVS. Then for the visits of parents to evacuated youngsters, a new idea has been started. The happy little family, reunited for the day, base their activities on a Sunday club in the reception area where they find a canteen provided. A similar idea is the communal dining room, where children are billeted on foster parents who go out to work. The midday meal is provided for them by institutions like this. And you may note that helpfulness and thoughtfulness are not the qualities only of those who wait on the children. Canteens, of course, play a big part in women's voluntary work. Here's a mobile unit that serves the troops in Scotland with food as well as literature, the same kind of travelling canteen as was inspected by the Queen in Buckingham Palace Yard. The fountain of inspiration to all British women, Her Majesty the Queen. With true understanding and in deepest unity with the womanhood of the nation, the Queen keeps close contact with every gallant effort, great and small. To her countrywomen, this is her own tribute. Tasks that you have undertaken, whether at home or in distant lands, cover every field of national service. And I would like to pay my tribute to all of you who are giving such splendid and unselfish help in this time of trouble. Her Majesty, as President, is head of this great voluntary effort which we have described, a democratic organization without officers, without ranks, without pay, where every member, whatever her task, wears the same badge as her queen. Women's Voluntary Services for Civil Defense.